Welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of WVU Marketing Communications Today. Brought to you from the good folks at West Virginia University. This is a syndicated show that sits squarely at the intersection of data-driven decision-making and modern marketing practices. And today, today we have another guest host with us coming from my old stomping ground, my neck of the woods, live from the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit. It's Whitney Drake, Senior Manager of General Motors Brand and Story Bureau. Welcome, Whitney. Thank you so much. She's got the voice, doesn't she, folks? We're reminiscing. I grew up in Detroit. We're talking about old famous DJs we grew up listening to with those deep voices here. Art Penhallow, that was the one I was thinking of at WRAF, or Alan Allman. What is the Story Bureau? Before you launch into your show here, that's an intriguing title. It's a department that creates stories through assets. They could be video, they could be releases, they could be podcasts to help us tell the story of our products, brands, and future technologies. Well, that is the story of all brands these days. They all want to tell the passion story, the purpose story, the founder story, the origin story, all these stories they want to convey to people. It's not just enough to give them features and benefits anymore here. you got to tell them the story behind the brand here. Today you're going to talk about the future of brands. Who did you bring in to talk about that? Joseph Jaffe is with us today to talk about the evolution of brands in the class that he teaches at WVU, which is IMC 649. I'm excited to have him. Okay, Joseph, are you there? I am. All right. What do you think about storytelling? Is that part of branding these days? I mean, I think storytelling is a part of everything. Storytelling has been around from those beautiful drawings in caves, allegedly. I wasn't there to see it, but I've, I've read stories about them and, uh, and always will be around. That's awesome. Thank you, Joseph. You are a multiple author, a serial entrepreneur, and one of the most sought-after consultants on marketing, innovation, and change. And today, we're going to talk about the future of brands, and we're going to make people think, do they have a future? I want to ask you, the world is changing, consumers are changing, why aren't brands and marketing changing? One of the most important, I think, stakes in the ground here is... The ability to recognize, and I think most people would agree with this statement, I don't even think it's provocative, is that the way that brands have been built up until now will be very different to the way that they will need to be built in the future. We can wax lyrical until the cows come home about attention, about multiple screen viewing, about the clutter that we witness, whether it's in a supermarket, whether it's through media, The fact is that the singular blunt object that has been used to build brands over as long as we can remember, which has really been for the most part advertising, is just that. It's a blunt object. It's a blunt instrument. And today consumers want more and they need more. And, you know, one of the things that I've been stewing on for a while is that ultimately we've taught, even our textbooks have taught, that effective marketing and effective branding equals the ability to charge a premium for that product. And and maybe the most famous example is carbonated sugar water, a.k.a. Coca-Cola. And I'm not trying to be cynical or skeptical, but ultimately when we kind of juxtapose or superimpose the idea of large companies offering a consistent product to a wide audience of scale, Why are we charging more for that product? Why are we not, in fact, charging less for it and being able to pass on savings to that consumer? And so you have these tensions, I think, that are coming together, which is what is marketing? What is effective marketing? How is marketing evolving? How can marketing be more believable, more authentic, more persuasive, more transparent? And juxtapose that authenticity with the ability to recognize that ultimately nothing happens until somebody sells something or until somebody buys something or until there's effectiveness and impact. And when we look at this world, this digital world, this disruptive world, this fluid and nonlinear world that we're living in right now, do we really see innovation and an evolution and disruption in marketing practices, best practices? I don't think so. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to bring and what I do bring to the table, which is 
ask the tough questions, challenge ourselves, challenge assumptions and sacred cows, and recognize that we're actually living in this most incredible time of innovation, of creativity, of change. And either we can get with the program or we can be left behind. So there have to be a few brands that have challenged sacred cows. Can you share a couple of examples that you think they've changed the status quo or they've looked at it in a different way? When we look at some of the giant brands that command our attention, our, that own significant percentages of our wallets or our share of wallets, they're what I call millennium, you know, they're millennial brands. They were born after 1980. And most of them built their businesses without advertising, without paid media. One of my books is called Zero. Zero paid media is the new marketing model. And so, you know, off the bat, we've seen that the ability to build a viable business, a business even at scale, is not in fact a function of traditional marketing, branding, and even advertising practices. And I mean, look no further than, you know, Amazon in terms of what they've been able to do and build. And yes, of course, for anybody listening, if you're jumping off your chair right now going, but wait a second, Amazon advertises. The answer is yes, they do. Advertising has become, and still, of course, let me just be clear, there is always going to be merit in in every practice done well, whether that's advertising, whether it's even advertising on the Super Bowl. But ultimately, advertising is what sustains and maintains as opposed to really being able to spearhead or launch a brand and propel them to that hockey stick growth curve. You know, it's funny because we've just, just a couple of weeks ago, experienced another Super Bowl, or as I call it very affectionately, the Stupid Bowl. And I just did a wrap-up show on a podcast that I sit on, and nobody on this panel, and these are marketing people, could even name more than four or five commercials that they just watched. So we have to ask ourselves these questions, which is who's doing a good job and what marketing practices are now elevating themselves. And it's companies like Patagonia and REI, it's companies that are actually letting their culture, their vision, their social responsibility, their customer obsession, their digital disruption, it's letting that lead the way. It's less about what they say and more about what they do. And even a company like Peloton, for example, which I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about one of their most recent missteps. But again, this is a company that has allowed an incredible, game-changing, life-changing, lifestyle-changing product. It's not even about a product. It's not even about a brand. It's about an experience and a community that has been transformational. And that's almost like my fallback, you know, Whitney, which is, you know, at the end of the day, it's like it's change the game or go home. That should always be our starting point, which is when we look at the status quo, when we look at incumbency and incumbent thinking, that's not going to be enough to save a corporation today. I was just writing my weekly newsletter and just talking about the fact Macy's has just closed down 150 stores. Wayfair has just laid off over 500 people. It's not necessarily about age or even size. It's about the ability to go to market with a what I call a survival instinct. If you're not truly alive, if you're not on your toes, if you're not on the top of your game at every single point in time, you run the risk of, even if you are a disruptor yourself, being disrupted by someone else. You talked a little bit about the corporations. You mentioned a few that are struggling What about if a corporation doesn't make it? Are there examples when a brand does? And how do we see that happen? So are you referring to a turnaround, for example? No, more like um, the corporation doesn't continue, but the brand lives on. I think there was a hotel that you mentioned. Yes, absolutely. Well, Well, actually, an airline, TWA, has almost come back to life in the form of the TWA hotel, which is at uh, JFK at the, at the JetBlue terminal. And what an unbelievable experience. I don't know where they're going to go with it, but you get transported into the good old Don Draper Mad Men days. 
and it's just a terrific, terrific experience. Of course, there is value in brands. Brands mean something. But, you know, one of the most important points, it's almost a nuance, but it's, a, I think, substantial, which is when a brand is an end unto itself, that is a decaying or stagnant or a limited brand. When the brand is a means to an end, when it's not about the corporation anymore, when it's not about the brand, the brand is not in the center of the universe. The brand is not the, the sun and, and the planet, you know, all the planets orbit around that sun. And to be clear, I don't even think the customer is in the middle. I don't even think your consumer is in the middle. I don't think anything or anyone is in the middle. It is, it is this very alive, dynamic, fluid, changing landscape that is less about hierarchical or superior and subordinate types of relationships. Instead, it's more about the ability to play a part in, in a story, right? To be, you're not the star, you're the co-star, you're part of the ensemble. That, to me, is a much better model. And we see that all the time, even with Hollywood, for example. One director, Quentin Tarantino, versus a, versus a Tim Burton, they have their bench, you know, they have their starting lineup, they have their bench, they have people that they rely on time and time again that they can trust, but there's also the ability to dynamically change the team based on the story, the subject, the theme, the objective, the mission or the goal. And so CWA, you know, will we see it come back as an airline? Probably not. I doubt it. But what else can that TWA brand in terms of what it stood for and what it represented, how can that be relevant in 2020? Whether it's a nostalgia play, whether it's almost a retro, what's old is new again play. So it's definitely an optimistic example for us to look towards to see that kind of Brands don't really die. They just stay dormant until somebody, until I guess some private equity invests in them and brings them back to life. I think it's a great point on the value of brands, the cost of rebuilding or building new brands. And with that, I think we're going to go to a break. Thank you. And just short enough to remind you that this program is brought to you by another big brand, West Virginia University, and their online data marketing communications program. It's the first graduate program of its kind in the country, focusing on strategic thinking, critical problem solving, and informed decision making. The data marketing communications program at WVU prepares you for your career by learning the innovative tactics from award-winning faculty like those we're talking with here today. If you want to learn more, it's pretty simple. You just got to remember these six letters. I'm sorry, nine letters. dmc.wvu.edu. Let me try that again. DMC for Data Marketing Communications. WVU for w West Virginia University. Edu. dmc.wvu.edu. <laughs> All right. Always a mouthful of letters there, but lots of information. So can I ask one quick question of your guests before you guys launch in here? Sure. Brands are everything. Everybody wants the 100-year-old brand. Can you be in business without having a brand, without having something instantly recognizable that tells a story? Or is that just yeah. part of the game today here? You have to have a brand. Well, the answer is yes with a twist, which is when we look at the the Ubers and the Airbnbs of the world. They went from zero to brand, right? In weeks, in months, they just burst onto the scene. And suddenly, for the most part, so many, even Instagram, we look at them as brands today. But for the most part, they were nothing more than just apps. They were just mobile apps that grew really quickly because of this super connected social world that we live in. And so... The rules are changing. It's part of the IMC program and part of the course that I've tried to adapt to, which is to recognize, of course, brands are important, but you can cut corners, or maybe not cut corners, but you can eliminate some of the, the steps that were considered to be mandatory or prerequisites before, just because the actual operating model is different. So today, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot about is all you need really to be your not-so-silent sales force 
are your employees and your customers. The most credible spokesperson is an employee, and the most influential salesperson is a customer. So when we can plug those people into the go-to-market strategy and get them to tell the story, we often see them advertising real customer. Well, why are we even saying real customer? We shouldn't even have to. It's because what we say typically is not believable. Because for the most part, the way branding or in the way advertising led was actor or professional driver closed course. We see a lot of car companies do that. I won't put you on the spot with me, but, but it's the ability <laughs> to, 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 we've got to bring or bridge the divide between what we say and what we do. And so going back to your point, ultimately about brands, what I don't believe in is falling back on the 100-year brand as a crutch because our parents used it or our grandparents used it. Today's millennial or Gen Z consumer is just not interested in baggage and legacy. They're going to make their own minds up. They're going to make autonomous, independent decisions, and they're going to trust people just like them. We've talked a bit about the value of brands, having brands, not having brands, and how they're built. How do we measure the value and equity of having it? So even in an app that's become a brand, how do you measure that? What does that mean? Well, well, I think that, and of course, you know, measurability and accountability is absolutely paramount. I think there are a couple of ways to look at it, right? There are soft measures and there are hard measures. And... And the soft measures are still based on, on brand, brand health indicators from favorability and preference and recall and message association, and there, and there are a ton of them. I like to move towards actual what I call POP, which is proof of purchase. Even looking at measures like Net Promoter Score, being able to measure the impact of delivery and execution and fulfillment did this live up to your expectations? Would you tell a friend? Would you, would you take your social capital and your social currency and put it on the line to recommend this good, this product, this service, this, this solution, knowing full well that uh, if it doesn't pan out or someone's disappointed, it's your neck on the line. I think being able to not hide behind Boja, it still uh, frustrates me that Ultimately, when we're measuring paid advertising, paid media, in particular analog television, we're still looking at even potential views. We're not looking at actual impact and engagement. So engagement is a big one. I'm sure it's something that's a big part of and factor of, of your own metrics with me, which is, and it's an important one, right? Which is, did we get your attention? Did we keep your attention? Will you remember us for the right reasons? But then comes the next thing, which is, will you act on that? Will you take action? Doesn't motivate you um, 100%. Yeah, does, yep. exactly. And, and, and I call it sometimes high-value action. And for me, that could be as simple as an email address capture. You know, because today, in this world of um, GDPR and CCPA and massive privacy regulation and backlash, the company that can build first-party first party relationships, first party data relationships where the customers will win and everyone else will lose. I mean, we look at this growth of these direct-to-consumer companies, all of them, right, whether it's Dollar Shave or Quip or, or Roman or, you know, they just go on and on and on. But they're building direct-to-consumer relationships and it's whether it's the profile, whether it's information like their birthday, but ultimately it's the data. And that data, the data doesn't lie. And the data tells the ultimate story. I often say, I've, I've always joked about it, that the Grand Prix, uh, the ultimate winner at CAM at some point in time in our future will be best data plan or best data mine or something to do with the geeks inheriting the earth. That we can be and should be and need to be creative and the ultimate storytellers and data will propel us. How do we integrate all of that into how we evaluate, measure, qualify, and quantify the power of brands and brand building and factor that into, into brand equity and brand value? And look, I keynoted last year for 
Cantor Worldwide. They just launched their brand Z uh, indicators. I've actually brought some of that thinking into my course, which is they're measuring the impact, the financial and economic impact and value of powerful brands. And it is measurable. So anybody that says it isn't, it's, it's flowery and fluffy and ephemeral. They're clearly not measuring the right things or hiding behind their own incompetency. One of my least favorite things, you can't measure it. You can measure everything. You just have to be super creative sometimes. So uh, yeah. you touched yeah. on something, and I want to try and wrap us up with it because we only have a few minutes left. I want to know what makes your course different and why someone should take it. Thank you for asking that question. What makes it different uh, is that I push off against, you know, my enemy is status quo. It's almost looking at the marketing textbooks and saying, this is outdated. This is limited and, uh, and almost stale in terms of factoring in this, how the world is changing and how regularly it is. And so I bring a lot of original thinking, and I've brought that on for many of my books, but in particular the latest one, which is called Built to Suck. The one thing that my students are going to do in terms of proving brand evolution strategy, in terms of thinking of how to change the way that they brand and, and how branding will change is that they have to pick a company on Death Watch, a brand, a recognized brand, and then they have to save that brand. So they have to prepare a survival plan and a growth plan using some of my own proprietary original thinking and methodology. It's very hands-on. It's fun. It's provocative because one of those companies is, is WeWork, but one of those companies is Coca-Cola as well. I mean, Coke's probably doing very well taking this position, but what if it isn't? But how do we know that it's going to be around in another 100 years when so many companies like Blockbuster and, and Kodak and Toys R Us and, and Sears have fallen by the wayside? So I think this very different approach, which is demonstrate the value um, of brands and ultimately of marketing by attempting to first prove that this company deserves to exist in the future and then help it figure out once it has that survival foundation, how do we, and, and that's going to be a combination of using what I call the growth pillars, which is digital disruption, customer obsession, talent resurrection, and corporate citizenship. And then at the end of this course, with these growth plans and survival plans in place, with the permission of my students, I'm hoping to share that as well publicly, which is to make us, you know, if I can help my students get a job as well if they need it, then why not? So it's going to be very engaging, interactive. And, and I can honestly say there is no student in the world that would be doing this kind of course because I wrote this course and it's completely original. And it goes against the normal marketing curriculum and the thoughts that we have about longstanding brands. There's nothing as a given. Everything can change. So I appreciate this time. Thank you so much for your perspective. I want to encourage people to go to wbumctoday.com and check out all of the podcasts. For sure, check out Joseph's class, which is IMC 649. And I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks for being with us. You've been listening to another example of WVU Marketing Communications Today, weekly program right here on the Funnel Radio Channel for outwork listeners like you.